Hello, one great earth. My name is Dan. I hope you are well. We got a lot to get into today. And the biggest uh, news right now for back. National preparedness level National preparedness level throughout the United States raised to EL5 National Multi-Agency Coordinating Group or NMAC has elevated the national preparedness level to 5 which is the highest level it goes this is um, it is the highest level of wildfire threat, and this is the earliest we have gone to PL5 in the past 10 years. Several geographic areas are experiencing large, complex wildfire incidents, which have the potential to exhaust national wildland. This is from the National Wildfire Coordinating Group, but a PL five watch out uh you know that's there six minutes for safety it's talking about smoke a lot of calamitous incidents out of control fires which is what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about the canadian wildfires And why don't I know the planning level or the preparedness level of uh, Canada? Right now, they're seeing real intense changes. This is an interactive map. As you can see, the Northwest Territories down to Alberta to, the, to British Columbia. Wash this out, but this is the exact area that we're seeing, not just Canadian wildfire smoke. We can try to use the federal uh, federal aviation admin to look at areas of and around Canada, North America, far North America. You can get a glimpse of how the sun's behaving. There's any kind of uh, Pollution in the air, we can see. Not as bright. Very bright sun. 
just bathes the land and uh, solar rays. Tell if this is cloudy. Okay, here we go. Something. All these components in the air make for a more deadly sun. I think that's just a land. Mainly just looking for pollution. It will look like pollution. Because Canada is in trouble right now. But worst is yet to come because we have massive. carbon monoxide signatures all across Saskatchewan to the Northwest Territories and the South British Columbia. These are areas where there should be fires occurring. And as the amount that it's putting up in the atmosphere, at least in the, in the uh, near, near air, this is concerning. I don't know when wildfire season officially begins in Canada. I know that there's probably about 1 million acres that are currently burning out of control right now throughout Canada. We can go for those fires, but there are just too many fires right now to point out individually throughout Canada. And also look at the aerosolization particulates. That looks hefty. This giant red blob here is what happens when wildfires kick up a lot of particulates into the atmosphere. Um, aerosolized particulates. And these signatures are pretty alarming. Go back a day just to make... Yeah. I go back a day and you can see how big of a difference it is. We're focusing on the area right here in Canada. Cut through much of the much of the country. And you see it starting to build up. Until it hits this massive amount of uh, aerosolized particulates. So there's something that we should be able to see on satellite. There's something that we need to be able to get a better idea of it. Now this is one example of, of a wildfire that's currently burning. This is a live image of uh, a wildfire burning.
in British Columbia. We can tell how wildfire is behaving. We can go into false color. This gives an idea of just the footprint of it and the amount of smoke that's kicking up into the air. Look at the false color. Get an idea of the actual fiery footprint that is currently engulfing the area. You can see just these uh, trails. This is wildfire smoke articulates that are being kicked up into the air. Because as wildfires burn, it violently throws particles into the air, which just bobs them. You get these huge areas of uh, pollution in a very short amount of time due to the way that wildfires behave. It just steamrolls in front of it and pushes out everything. Everything that burns gets thrown out. These moisture index. These are redder parts here that are burning. Fiercest. At least it should be. This is just one fire. One one wildfire of potentially dozens burning throughout Canada. Now this will happen again. This smoke will get in the jet stream as the wind continually will make passes and it will cause this dissipate. It will take parts of it with it over the Hudson Bay, over other parts of Canada. But will it get as bad as it did before? Yes. Because it already looks bad. This smoke has to go somewhere. These particles have to go somewhere. These particulates are airborne. Get kicked up thousands of feet into the air and gets caught up in a stream of air that will allow it to travel. Or it made as far away as the Midwest to the Northeast to Greenland. It's uh, just incredible to see it's just how bad Canada already is when it comes to the air quality and wildfire coverage. It's all smoke. All of this is smoke. And all of this that is a different color than the clouds, that's all smoke. We can verify this by coming back to uh, NASA's Earth worldview here. We can see just how thick the aerosol index is for this area. Not area, but just a huge portion of Canada. Alberta, Northwest Territories, Saskatchewan, and is getting remnants of it. That gives you an idea of where the wildfires are burning right now. Doesn't really help. Because you can't click and see, okay, this fire is burning 100,000 acres. Fire is out of control and it's burning 20,000 acres. You don't get a sense of that with this website, uh, Dust. That. Bit of a dust storm there.
And you can see how just how bad this gets so quickly as storm systems and fronts condense, press, mix, smoke into uh, wind channels into the jet stream is caught up whenever the smoke becomes when the smoke material becomes light enough to be carried away after wind makes so many passes at it and it takes out more and more particulates out of the smoke looking at not very long. I mean, this smoke is already in the air. It's already crossing over Saskatchewan and Manitoba. I didn't think that we saw any wildfires burning that far south. But we can see wildfires burning throughout Alberta, right here. This is just one wildfire. This is happening quickly. Um, unlike last year, it just built up over weeks, it felt like. This is happening quickly. This is going to catch people off guard, I think. It's a lot of smoke that's getting kicked up into the air. It gets kicked up into the atmospheric swirls. But eventually, in tandem, causes smoke to reach places that it are, is far away from where the fires actually were. It's uh, utter mayhem just how Canada is already seeing massive amounts of wildfire that you can. Identify them from space. One, two, three, four, five, at least six. It is pretty massive. Now these might be more than just one wildfire. I'm just looking at the their point, their origins. Now when we talk about the air cycle it's happening. We would have to go up and above a little bit. Going further up into the atmosphere and looking at how wind channels behave south of the Hudson Bay and recycling around itself. Greenland's not available. You see here, this is where all the smoke is. It will find its way up when it becomes light enough, when enough material is stripped out of the smoke in the air causing it to rise up further and get carried away into areas far from 
the uh, fire's point of origin. We're looking at heavy winds that are churning, that are sp uh, swirling, that are looking at pulling fires out for miles, tens of miles, hundreds of miles. These huge areas of burn where smoke meets itself. And what smoke does is smoke mixes. Because it's going to be just these two bodies of smoke and heavy carbon and melting. So it's not that you get one front of smoke that hits another front and kind of does this engulfing thing and they just meld together. So trying to fight wildfire smoke by creating other wildfires is not recommended because the wildfire smoke will just meld together. It won't it won't stop it. Of what we're looking at here. You can see just how complex it gets. How wildfire smoke is just point blank right there in, in the midst of all these channels of wind. Hudson Bay is in a huge gear. Takes a lot of the air and recycles it. That air can come back to the Midwest and Northeast again in due time. I have no way of showing that this is going to happen. But it's just the amount of wildfires that Canada sees itself burning. And just the amount, this huge complex uh, ceiling of uh, smoke. Massive. We're looking at a huge disproportionate amount of smoke in the sky. And smoke causes um, breakups of cloud structures. You see the smoke and it's going to push away cloud structures. The smoke is climate change in itself that it will cause an alarming amount of changes rapidly because nothing thrives under smoke. And Canada is huge. So seeing that this is already spread across at least three provinces, we're not looking at a good fire season. We're already DL5 nationally in the United States. For whatever Canada's system is, We know that these areas of wildfire are noted already. We're seeing wildfire smoke that's being picked up, kicked up. All these fires feed these smoke structures. These wildfires are visible from space.
we're all gonna go somewhere. Don't be caught off guard this this time. It's already happening. We're not getting wildfire smoke in the northeast, in the Midwest, to wildfires in the far west, the southwest. We're gonna get it from Canada. It'll happen again. This is already happening. It's already there. It's the smoke's already being disturbed, already being pulled out. Uh, filtered uh, of particulates that make it heavier, allow it to go travel further. So it's nuts. Nuts that we're already seeing these kind of fires already over huge swaths of Canada. using curtain or sheet behind me not working out all right I'm looking at this temperatures are soaring throughout Canada Especially in the areas that we see fire. Two massive areas of Saskatchewan and Northwest Territories. Pretty big uh, normally in these 540 we're seeing words of 325. The ozone, a lot of carbon dioxide. This for let's say twenty five hundred parts uh, PBEV carbon dioxide for these two areas here that are of a uh, great highlight. Seeing massive amounts of smoke being churned. So far, it doesn't look like the smoke's making its way past Manitoba. But a lot of activity, and it's, it's really pushing uh, east. It's really getting hold of the wind, getting into the wind. That's causing an alarming amount of smoke over Canada. All this is smoke. This is something that we're going to have to deal with eventually is Canadian wildfires that just seem endless. 250,000 acres out of control, 130,000 acres out of control, 
564,213 acres out of control. You see the kind of blazes that they're dealing with here. It is monstrous, monumental. It's not just that we're seeing lots of smoke. We're seeing fires that go from several hundred acres to several thousand acres in a day. How many more summers are we going to be able to have this ha uh, happen before it becomes a severe health crisis? So we're worried about children's schools being too close to factories. But this, this wildfire smoke is nasty stuff, real nasty stuff. As a result, these uh, wildfires put out a huge amount of smoke that replaces a lot of the cloud structures. And it makes smoke structures caught up in the air. And unlike normal cloud structures, you would see smoke fixed together and moves and it just stays sta static it's caught up in the wind it doesn't it doesn't get manipulated in the air like normal cloud structures would if they replace because it's so tremendously thick It is uh, unfortunate to see again. To know that there's millions of acres burning already. We too do. Canada able to fight these wildland wildfires? Because as of right now, we don't want this wildfire smoke to reach Greenland. It's glaciers, icebergs. We don't want heat. We don't want any more. That happened last year. We don't want it to happen again. It's just deliriously bad stuff. Looks like the smoke's going to go towards. Keep migrating east because that's all it's going to do. It gets pushed around, fixed to each other. Looking back at it now, pretty bad. A, a huge evolving situation of smoke, air pollution, due to wildfires that are churning out record amount of acreage burned already. North America, I believe, uh, we're over the halfway point where we were last year. An amount of land burned. I'm sorry, in America, in the U.S., not the not Canada, North, North America. These fires burning in Canada are massive. I don't know how else to show it. And just what a threat this wildfire smoke is already becoming so early. is July 18th, 2024. And we've been looking at these wildfires. It's a aggressive amount of smoke. I'm really, like this just came out of, let's go back in day.
just dirty. Getting passed around and travel and for hundreds of miles. Take that same amount of smoke in his visual. We're in trouble. More area to look at. They're all fires. Picking up huge amounts of smoke and particulate matter into the atmosphere until happening again again wildfires of Canada it is huge it's 10 kilometers An inferno. It is a much larger fire than I thought. Efficiently keeping it. Satellite. Pretty significant. There's a lot of smoke that's kicking up into the air. We have a lot of... This is a complex fire. A lot of fires burning throughout the area that you can see here. That looks like fire. The spots of interest that might be fire
coral bleaching detected in waters around Taiwan due to heat waves. Taipei. Local environmentalists have expressed concern about a large scale coral bleaching in the southern and eastern waters off the coast of Taiwan, which has been occurring, which has been occurring since June due to a prolonged heat wave. Lane Chen, Secretary General of Taiwan Eco Angel Environmental Conservation Association, told local media that divers had detected coral bleaching in waters off the coast of Kenting in southern Taiwan, as around Little Lukwu, Orchard, and Green Islands since June. Taiwan Luku Yu Association, another environmental non-governmental organization also reported instances of coral bleaching in June and July. When the seawater temperature exceeds 28 degrees Celsius for two weeks, symbiotic algae within coral polyps emit toxins that are harmful to coral polyps, causing them to expel from the coral and revealing transparent coral polyps with white coral skeletons. The phenomenon commonly known as coral bleaching. Coral bleaching. Bleaching to coral is heat stroke to human being. Very serious. Back to our map. Record amounts of bleaching. See it all over the planet. Northeast of Brazil. The Gulf of Mexico is filling up. In record amounts of coral bleaching across the globe, which leads to stronger storms because coral reefs act as friction. Or to storm. Also, increased sea temperatures cause a lot more energy to be gathered up for a storm as well, as we saw earlier already with Hurricane Barrel. With Hurricane Barrel went from here, not 100%. I think it was a category five and four between these two areas. Climate change makes already existing weather tremendously worse, as we're seeing. This is from The Guardian, how to solve a mass stranding, what caused 77 healthy whales to die on a Scottish beach. A team of scientists are trying to find the cause of what has become an increasingly common event and the answer may be hidden deep in the whale skulls.
mass stranding last week that led to the deaths of 77 pilot wells on the Orkney Island of Sandy was the largest ever recorded of the species on British shores. Initially, 12 of the animals at Restness Beach were still alive, but sadly did not survive. The event occurred almost exactly a year after the stranding of 55 pilot whales on Tolsta Beach on the island of Lewis in the Hebrides on July 16th, 2023. All but one of those whales died, according to Dr. Andrew Brownlow, director of the Scottish Marine Animal Stranding Team, SMAS, at Glasgow University. This may not be a coincidence. The Orkney Stranding last week has so many parallels with what happened a year ago in terms of number of animals involved and their behavior, he says. Brownlow's research proposes a drastic scenario that mass strandings are increasing exponentially in the number of animals and events. There have been <clears throat> 13 mass strandings of pilot wells since the mass was started in 1992, and of which and of which have been in the last decade. Evidence indicates that the situation is only going to get worse. Long-finned pilot whales can reach up more than 7 meters in length and are found in temperate waters around the world. These sleek black animals are named after their apparent propensity for following a lead or pilot whale, hence their near suicidal urge to accompany an alien individual ashore. Often found together in great numbers, pilots are among the most likely Invitations to become stranded. Blame in the past has been placed on severe weather conditions, illness, and solar storms disrupting the whale's natural navigation system and deceiving them into swimming onto shore. But are those are these the reasons for the most recent stranding and rise in events over the years? A team of twenty two scientists from SMAS and the Cetacean Stranding's investigation program from London's Institute of Zoology, working on the Sandy site along with Stranding's officers from Cornwall in Wales and a race against time, a sort of CSI whale. Many attended last year's Stranding while they were unable to make full post-mortem examinations of the animals due to delays in hot weather causing rapid decay. However, Muriel 10, Chat, one of the scientists, says this time they have been able to perform post-mortems on 20 animals. The squid in their stomachs, it was clear that these animals had recently fed, she says. Ruling out illness for a reason for the stranding, she explains that these were very healthy whales, comprised not of one pod but a mixed clan aggregation, several different pods that come together to breed. Among them were two calves, age two or three weeks old, and at least one of the females was found to be pregnant. Crucially, Dos Chait notes that their position on the beach was clustered around key animals in the group. This strongly suggests they had been frightened into coming ashore as a stress response. They might have been fleeing predators, orcas have been seen in the areas, she says, but the scale of the Orkney Stranding may prove long-held suspicions that extremely loud, loud sounds caused by people were responsible. The evidence for such damage is found in tiny hair cells embedded within the organ of the corti, which converts sounds into electrical signals that can be transmitted to the brain through the auditory nerve. This is the holy grail of whale biologists embedded in the animal's walnut-sized ear bones, or Uh, embedded in the animal's walnut-sized ear bones are cochleas, which are themselves buried deep within the whale's skulls. They use spectrogram, spectrograms showing a spectrum of signal frequencies varying over time. Three types of whale vocalization, clicks, whistle, and a pulse call. 
It is a paradox that the fate of these huge animals might come down to such tiny things. The hair, cell, the hair cells, which can be scarred by severe sonic events, must be delicately extracted from the cochlea. Unfortunately, the bone is so dense that samples will have to spend up to a year softening in a chemical solution in a laboratory before the hair cells can be examined. Dos Chait says that the team has successfully retrieved six cochlea for analyses. In last year's stranding, there was a significant number of animals that were pregnant or in the process of giving birth to the brown low. So they're using these waters as calving areas. But the problem with that is if these waters are noisy, then that's a dangerous hazard for animals that have a herd mentality that are easily spooked and you have some complex beaches that are difficult to navigate around and are opaque to their sonar. Since the 1980s, researchers have cited the damaging effect of noise pollution on whales and dolphins, from seismic surveys for oil and gas to military sonar. The Brownlow Council's caution, suggesting that natural earthquakes may also have the same effect. Whatever the reasons for the Orkney event, it is consequences are serious, not only for the patients, but for also for the health of our seas. A measured and careful scientist, Brownlow, nonetheless delivers a stark warning. We've got to be really careful about what else we are doing in those waters. Otherwise, this is going to become a horrifically common occurrence. Seventy-seven. Each pilot whales. Scottish shore. Scottish beach. This is massive. Along with calves that were just weeks old. Along with actually pregnant females. such an alarming amount of whales become beached. Very similar to what they were just talking about happened last year. Pile whales have been washing up on beaches rapidly in the last years. You see pods of them just wash up on shore. Dying. Elephants are doing something deeply human. They're part of a growing list of animals that use name-like calls. Bats, porpoises, dolphins, 
Tails, penguins, llamas, elephants, and birds. A lot of different kinds of birds. The best language as the best thing language has ever done for us as far as I'm concerned is give us the ability to talk with one about one another why bother well yeah so sorry. this is from the Atlantic by Tove Danovich why bother with words if you can't get your friends attention on a crowded street and pull them aside to complain about your nemesis. Language, that is to say, would be largely useless without names. As soon as a group is bigger than a handful of people, names become essential. Referring to someone who shares your cave or campfire as that guy goes only so far. Perhaps because names are crucial and personal, naming things can feel uniquely human. And until a little over a decade ago, scientists predominantly thought that was true. Then in 2013, a study suggested that bottlenose dolphins use name-like calls. Scientists since have found evidence that parrots and perhaps whales and bats use calls that identify them as individuals too. In June, a study published in Nature Ecology and Evolution showed that elephants do the same. Among humans, at least, names are inextricably linked with identity. The fact that we're not unique and using them is a tantalizing sign that we aren't the only beings who can recognize ourselves and those around us as individuals. Many animals are born with the ability to make a specific collection of sounds, such as alarm calls that correlate with aerial predators or threats on the ground. But names, by definition, have to be learned. Mickey Pardo a postdoctoral researcher at Colorado State University who led the elephant study told me, Every species that uses auditory names or name-like identifiers must necessarily be capable of what scientists call vocal production learning, the ability to learn and produce new sounds or modify existing ones. The fact that so many different species are capable of vocal production learning use name-like calls, especially species with such different evolutionary lineages. So far, the species that uses names, including us humans, are highly social. We live in fluid groups, um, to track each other, call each other by name, get each other's attention, get each other of danger or food. From Tova Danovich. Bats use echolocation calls to distinguish between other individuals. Dolphins may be able to recognize familiar companions based on their urine in the water. We even know that. Species might not recognize itself in the mirror and fail the mirror test, still able to identify their young. So these animals that are born have a clock for their ability to communicate with their own species.
and have gone too long, might not be able to communicate with the aspect of their species. Thank you for joining me so far. Please, if you haven't already, click the follow button on the stream. It helps me out tremendously. All right. Hi, right, thank you for your time. Please, even if you are watching this on YouTube as a replay, as of now, I am streaming this live on Twitch. And I am uploading it onto YouTube after. Because YouTube has definitely suspended my ads account, and they consistently make it difficult for my material to be seen by... Uh, even give me an 18 plus restriction visibility of my videos. And I don't even swear. I'm not sure what gets flagged or reported. All I know is that YouTube has made it impossible for me to continue the channel. And uh, I had a maximum of 6,500 subscribers. Felt like that was uh, going someplace, but. With so much of my account disabled, it feels like I'm not able to get out there the same way anymore. Not able to be recommended or be in the recommendations of more people. Because so much of the account is locked down. I just assume the account's at a loss, so I'm just going to upload the videos from Twitch after the stream onto YouTube. I'm not sure exactly what I did, if anything, or if it was just covering climate change and it gets reported, period. Okay. Thank you for your time. Please, if you haven't already, follow me on Twitch. It helps me out immensely. I'd like to see these numbers increase. Please take care.